Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, our final speaker today uh, is the director at Palantir, wrote Managing Humans, second edition, and also wrote Being Geek, Michael Lapp. Hear me? Yeah, you know you can. How's it going? How's it going? What time does the thing start tonight? Am I like interfering with the music over at the thing? Is it starting right now? So you're all here rather than going to the music? Does anyone know what the band is? Anyone? You can't go because you don't have tickets. Oh, which is why you're at AltConf. Irony. Got it. I'm really going to enjoy this thing right here. Um, hey, where's the camera? Can I wander around a lot? Nope. OK. Like, where's my side over here, people? Oh, this here? OK, sweet. Wow, they have markers. Sweet. Awesome. Hi. Um, this is the slide you're not supposed to see. This is so we can tell how the projector is doing. And we're just going to grade the projector here as an opening thing. You can see we've got a little cropping going on with the circles. The color looks good. The ratios are right. Um, and the fonts appear to be installed. So that's great. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Lopp. I don't actually work at Palantir anymore. I actually, this is my last day. And you guys are sitting here like knowing that I don't work there anymore. Where am I going? <laughs> Interesting. Um, uh, you'll hear about that next week. Anyway, um, we're going to do a little talking about uh, things that don't involve code. We're going to talk about nerds, which <laughs> we're in good company. Here we go. You ready? You sitting down? It's happening. Humans are bad. What the hell happened here? <laughs> this is, what you're looking at is you're looking at the plugs uh, for the planet Earth. And you will notice that <laughs> there are a lot of different plugs. Let's be super clear about the use case here. We are delivering power from point A to point B. And we have all of these interfaces. So my question to you and my opening statement for you is what the hell happened here? Um, humans are bad. Each of these has a story. Each of these things that are they, there's a reason. The one from the UK is uh, designed how it is because during World War II they had a lack of brass. And, but there's a story here for each one of these. But like, what a cluster, right? Let's make it a little simpler. Let's make it a little more obvious. Here are how those different plugs are actually used around the planet Earth. You will look and kind of see like, okay, in the US we're pretty good. Um, looks over in Russia, they've got like a, well, three plugs. But like if you go down there and you can't actually see it, <clears throat> In um, El Salvador, they have 10 different plugs. <laughs> There's 10 different plugs in play. What the hell? That means you go over to Frank's house, you've got a, and you want to plug something in, you're like, oh, i got to bring 10 plugs just in case. That's not really how it works. But like, what's going on here? What happened here? Maybe we should just talk about one plug. Actually, it's not this plug anymore, right? <laughs> It's not actually this plug anymore. And you were probably there watching the stream when you realized that they did this. And they made it that plug. I remember watching this. I don't know if it was Tim or Steve or whoever was doing it. But I went, holy shit. I'm going to have to buy all my stuff again. And I was mad. I'm like, why are you doing this to me? What's going on here? But they did something very important. And I want to talk about what the decision that came into this. But more importantly, because I'm the people guy, I want to talk about the, the people behind this and how they came to that decision. We're going to talk about stables and volatiles. Um, my name is Michael Lopp. If you don't know, I worked at Apple for a little while. Until recently, like today, <laughs> I worked here. I don't work there anymore. We'll talk more about that next week. Um, and I'm this guy on Twitter called Rands, who sounds like a fortune cookie, which is cool. I wrote a couple of books. I wrote a book called Managing Humans, which is a good leadership book for the um, engineering types who find management books to be awful. And then I wrote another book called Being Geek, which is really a career handbook for anyone. I'm going to start you with three themes and um, to kind of set the stage. And I really want to walk on this a lot, by the way. I keep on looking at it. I want to jump on it. But I've got to stay here in the white line. I'm going to start you with three themes. Three themes are the following. People. Theme number one, you're in a hurry. You're in a hurry. My current experience only proves what I already knew, which is 
we in the high tech industry in having lots of opportunity and having sort of a short attention span, um, we tend to change our gigs about every three years. I've seen a lot of resumes and I've lived it myself. We tend to change our gig every three years. What's going on there? What's happening? I will tell you what's happening. You have a short attention span. You like stimulus. Once the problem set is understood, once the political landscape is understood, once the product is done, we get bored. And we go somewhere else. Your gig has an expiration date. Now, I was at Apple for eight and a half years, and you're gonna say, hey, Rans, Lop, whatever your name is. <clears throat> that was more than three years. I had three gigs at Apple, and every three years, plus or minus a couple months, I was like, time to change. I started on the Mac OS X server team, three years, kind of bored, what's going on here? They said, hey, go to a wiki server and a calendar server. And I said, great, that sounds interesting. That's a compelling problem, let's go do that. Didn't work out so well. So about a year and a half later, I went over and took over the Apple store. And about three years after I got there, I was talking with my wife, and I, she said, I was talking to her, I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm working on the store, blah, 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 people, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm kind of getting bored. And my wife's face went ashen. She said, not this shit again. Because <laughs> she knew it was coming. She knew that I was bored, and I would leave a company that was doing reasonably well, Apple Computer, right? I'm sorry, Apple. I left. This is the thing I want you guys to think, and gals to think about, is you're three years away from your next gig. Gary, maybe. Here's the other thing. 1.0, the act of shipping that new thing is going to kill you. How many of you have done 1.0? Love it. That's the highest hand rate ever in this talk. Was it fun? <laughs> did it suck? Did you despair? I'm sure that you did, right? You're like, I am so screwed. I have totally thrown my heart into this. It's awful. The act of bringing something new into the world is hard. It's incredibly hard. And sometimes it works out. Most times it doesn't. 1.0 is really, really hard. This term that we're using right now in this valley is disruption is People are saying it like it's, like it's a new thing. It's been going on here for a very, very long time. Um, this was the Silicon Valley. Um, I don't know, 19, whatever it was. Poppies, orchards. This looks beautiful. Santa Clara. What a beautiful postcard. This is what it is now. <laughs> what? 1,854 square miles, 3 million souls. Incredible nerd density. How did it happen? How many of you know a gentleman named William Shockley? Show of hands. What did he do? Transistor. He invented the transistor. Do you know how many transistors are in the room right now? A lot. Now, William Shockley is the Nobel Prize winning inventor of the transistor, which is kind of cool. But that's not actually how he contributed well, he contributed significantly to the Silicon Valley. He also contributed something which is really interesting to me and has something to do with stables and volatiles is he was a jerk. <laughs> he was an asshole. <laughs> he was a racist. This is a bad human being. <laughs> this is really, what? Rand's buzzkill of a talk at the end of the day. <laughs> but what he did in, ironically, Palo Alto is he took his Nobel Prize and he sat there and he attracted all this talent and they went in their garage or wherever the hell they were and the uh, first eight people that he hired realized this guy was awful. This was an awful human being. He's a bad manager. He's a micromanager. Everything we hate about leaders was this guy. <laughs> so what they did, this group that's called the Traitorous Eight, is they left. They voted with their feet and they got the hell out of there and they founded companies, oh, I don't know, called Fairchild Semiconductor, uh, Intel, which are important companies in the Silicon Valley. But more importantly, he create, they hated him so much, they said, we need a culture that is so different than what this guy was like and we're here on the west coast far away from east coast establishment. They created a different culture. They did a culture which has a lot to do with why we're sitting here right now. They got rid of titles. They got rid of dress codes, mostly. They got rid of reserved parking lots. They introduced the concept of stock options. Until these guys and gals showed up, 
All the executives got the stock options. Does that feel fair? Hell no, it doesn't. <clears throat> what they created was this concept of an egalitarian workplace. And it exists because of what I would argue, this guy here who was awful, and by the way is also, spoiler alert, a volatile. He's the way he's in, how many are you wearing flip-flops? Flip-flops in the off? Really? In the back? Just one? Seriously? It's San Francisco, people. Is it the fog? Is that the problem? Okay. <laughs> he is the re it's summer in San Francisco, and you're not wearing flip-flops. That's weird. Um, okay, but here's the thing. The things that came out of this guy being awful and their reaction and the companies that they created is this concept of a flat organization. There's, there's, there's two models for uh, leadership in the Valley, in my opinion. There's the Apple model, which is the HP model, which is teams of about seven or plus or minus three people. And if you look at Apple, the teams that Steve cared about were, you know, it was Steve, VP, director, and uh, lead. And that level of three, it sounds like a lot, right, if you've got a company of 10 people. But like in a big company, three levels of leadership is not a huge amount. That's an interesting model. And that's the model that Apple has. It's something that we, we built at Palantir, the company I used to work at. <clears throat> the other model is the Google model, which is um, you've got one person and they've got 100 direct reports. Now the reason that works is there's these vents in the ceiling at Google out of which pours money. <laughs> <laughs> And that money covers up for a lot of leadership mistakes. They're getting different, and there's, they're getting different models there. But this flat organization concept is something that came out of this lack of this idea of we don't want bureaucracy came out of this early, uh, these early teams that came out of this uh, reaction to the, the what's his name? Uh, what's his name? I've already, Shockley. Speed, the idea that with free-flowing information, these flatter organization structures, you get faster decisions, the product gets to market faster. Collaboration, this idea that we're really big on when they're transparency, that we're sharing all the information. It's easy to find it and we can share it and we can make better decisions because we're sharing all this. And then finally, results orientation. Is there any HR in the room? HR, are you here? Probably not. Uh, lawyers, are you here? No lawyers, also good, really. Would you raise your hand, lawyers, if you actually? How about um, <laughs> MBAs? Nope, right over here. You're in trouble, sir. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. We as engineers have a huge problem with these groups I just described because we don't understand what value they're creating. Now, all teams do this in all directions. We always assume like, oh, it's marketing. It must be easy because all they do is the website or whatever it is. But here's the thing, and I learned this really deeply at Palantir, is like, we have this, engineers, we have this focus on results. What is the value that we're creating? This is a problem we have with HR when they show up and they have all this power and we're like, why do you have this power? I don't understand why. You seem to know all these words and things seem to happen and I'm scared of you, but why? What's going on here, right? This is a huge problem that we have, we engineers we have, which is why at Palantir, my former company, we don't have all these things because we want people, we have all those functions, but they're usually populated with a lot of engineers. We want to have the sense of prove to me, explain to me in words, with logic, what is the value that you're creating here? It's a Zuckerberg. I, it's sort of the Zuckerberg era that we're in right now. Shoes, flip-flops, whatever it is. The thing is, we've got this engineering mindset. What do the following com what do the companies following companies have in common? Google, uh, not really Apple, Palantir, um, Dropbox, um, uh, what else? Uh, Cora. Here's the interesting thing about these companies: all the leadership, CEOs, are engineers. There's this very interesting thing going on right now where engineers are kind of running the show, which is kind of awesome. We are risk takers. Silicon Valley has this high tolerance for risks. Fail fast. One in ten successful. One in ten of six. One in ten startups are successful. I think it's better than that now. We assume it's okay to fail. Do we like failure? No. I don't think we like failure. What we like is the ability to learn at scale. Right? When you're going, what engineers like, which I believe engineers like, is this idea that I'm going to learn something. Even though I might fail. Failing is a consequence. Learning is actually the cool stuff. This is one of my favorite pictures of my former company. This is Gary Kasparov. He's playing speed chess against the Palantir engineering team. You've got a table out here, all the way over here and over here. And what he's doing is he's kicking the, the shit out of the entire team. <laughs> he's just waxing them. Right? It's just like there's no one has a chance. And he's playing whatever. Like, 10, 20 people at the time. Now, I want, that's not the interesting part of this photo. The interesting part of this photo is the people behind. 
those folks back there, that's the engineering and product team at Palantir, and they're all smiling. They just got their asses kicked, and they're smiling. Why are they smiling? Because they're learning from the master. They're going, oh my god, <laughs> did you see how he just killed me? I gotta take that apart. What happened there? I, I thought it was a pretty good chess player. We love to learn. Engineers love to learn. Builders love to learn. However, in what is the longest intro into a talk ever, there is a spectrum through these builders. I'm going to talk to the guy named Stefan. And my first startup is a guy named Stefan. This is before I was at Apple. And we hired him as a contractor, and he was going to clean up the database stuff. And he came in, and he said, great. I'll get started on the database stuff. And he's like, do you smell something? I smell something. It was about 30, 40 of us at the time. And he's like, oh, I know that smell. We're never going to ship. <laughs> you guys are going to talk a lot, and it's going to go around a while, and you're never going to ship. So this guy, who we're paying to do the database work, said, hey, OK, intern, intern Frank. You're intern Frank. Intern Frank, hey, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to go in the ping pong room. We're going to work on the product until it works, until we can demo it. And intern Frank, who was just happy to like, be called on, said, sweet, awesome. What do you mean? It works. He's like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Let's get started right now. And he grabbed him, and they went in the ping pong room, and they started hacking. And three weeks passed, and the ping pong room reeked. It was awful because half of the engineering team had been there for three days straight. And we got a demo of the product working. The thing that the project managers, project managers, are you in the room? OK, OK, you might be in trouble. Um, was saying, like, oh, it's six months away. And it was. It was a short amount of time, and we got a demo. And everyone was so happy. And the team was energized. They stunk, but they were energized. <laughs> and they clapped. We all clapped. We're like, oh my god, it's working. Look at the product. Holy crap. Stefan, thank you for that. But not everyone was clapping. Because not everyone, not the folks, about three of the folks in the room were not clapping because they'd, see, they'd seen Stefan before. And they knew who he was. And he was a volatile. And they knew he was. He'd cut corners to get it work. He knew that they, there was some, probably some duct tape and some spit and bailing wire kind of holding it all together. And, he knew, and they knew that when we actually had a real customer that had to like get to scale, there would be a problem. And they were right. A year later, big customer, threw a couple thousand users on it, and it just came crumbling down. That's why they weren't clapping. My question to you is, did Stefan do the right thing? I don't know. There are two types of folks, engineers, that I want to talk about, which is it's a very long intro. These are archetypes that I'm going to talk about. You're going to start nodding and go like, God, oh, that's totally a volatile. That's a stable. These are archetypes. In reality, it's all gray. But I'm going to talk about two archetypes. The stables are these wonderful human beings who we need, who are, they will happily work with direction. They appreciate there appears to be a plan. They like schedules. They play nice with others. They value efficiently run, no drama teams. They calmly assess risk and carefully work to mitigate failure, however distant or improbable it might be. Do you know this person? I bet you do. Is this person valuable? Yes, they are. They tend to generate process because they know that process creates predictability and measurability. Now, we engineers don't like process because it tends to slow us down. I would argue that we don't like about process, we don't like process that can't defend itself, that we don't understand the value that's being created. And with someone holding power over us without actually explaining why this process is good. Great process is documented culture. It's the things that we've learned that we're writing down and saying, we have this lesson, and it's worth documenting. We follow this process. If you want to get in a stable's head, we have the toaster test. The toaster test is the following. <clears throat> the way stables think has a lot to do with how they make decisions. So research shows if a consumer is given a choice between a $20 toaster and this somewhat better $30 toaster, they choose the $20 toaster. Same thing. Save 10 bucks. No big deal. I don't actually need four slices. It's only me and my cat, so I'm going to get two slices. I'm fine with that. Now, what's really interesting is when you go and you throw another toaster into the mix, this $50 toaster, which is marginally better than the $30 toaster, the same person was going to look at this and go like, well, you know, I need this. They're going to go move up to the $30 toaster. 
and you're nodding your heads, and it makes sense, right? I'm not going to spend all the money. I'm going to spend some of the money. And like, look, I can get four here. The data, only data that added, changed here was that you added this fancy new toaster in it. It's called salience in decision making. And what it is is that we tend to, one's attention is, is uh, differentially directed towards the most recent data they have. It's a very stable decision that you made. And then there's these other folks, these volatiles. <laughs> they prefer to find strategy rather than follow it. They cannot conceive of failing, and they find a thrill in risk. They often don't predict, build predictable or stable things, but their ability to generate stuff is world class. But it's often like, how did you do that so fast? Well, you probably cut some corners. They are often only reliable when it's in their best interest. One of my favorite things to do with volatiles, and my kids, it turns out, is the following move. Hey, Frank, I don't think you can do this. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> um, I, I've been thinking about it a lot. It's a really hard problem, but I know you can't do it, but it's incredibly important, and you know, I'd like your thoughts on it. I know you can't do it, but <laughs> let, let, you know, what it, volatiles leap at this. They're like, fuck you. I can totally do it. What are you talking about? They see working with others as time consuming, consuming onerous, they prefer to work in small, autonomous teams, and they could care less how you feel. These are jerks. And you're in here right now, and I know you're talented, but it's not that you don't care about the other humans, it's just caring is low on the list of things that you care about. <laughs> right? If you actually ask them, hey, you're being a jerk. Yeah, I am. But that's like 17 on the list of things, and performance is number one. So let's focus on performance, right? They're jerks. I love them all. They're jerks. Not all of them. <clears throat> we go use our toaster test with the volatiles. The following occurs. Well, if, you give a, if you give a volatile the cho choice between the $20 toaster or the $30 toaster, they tend to choose flying toasters. There's a theme song to this. Does anyone know it? No? It really is. <laughs> There's actually lyrics going on at the bottom of this. Sometimes we want our toasters to fly. Sometimes we want our toasters to fly. This is an absurd thing I just said. But here you are watching toasters fly, and you laugh, because you've seen this before. How many of you know what this is? Of course. I mean, you're like, what is this crazy toaster thing going on here? OK, who has not? doesn't know what After Dark is, show of hands. I'm going to pick on you. All right. Lucky you. All right. Here's what we're going to do. What's your name? Ted? Thank you for not having a very complex name. I usually ask that, and I get something from, like, Hungary. And I'm like, I'm going to call you Ted. Um, so, Ted, here's the deal. What we're going to do, <laughs> what we're going to do here is you're a VC, Ted. Music's still going. And I'm going to ask you whether you're going to fund my idea or not, all right? I'm going to pitch you, and then you go, yes, it's a great idea, Rans, or no, you're an idiot. OK. Um, I have this idea, Ted. And the idea is pretty big. It's pretty big. What I'm going to do is it's a piece of software that's only going to work when you're not there. I know. <laughs> it's huge. right? What's going to happen is when you're not there, this thing is going to happen on the screen, which is um, going to protect the screen. And it's really important that your screen is protected. And it's really useful when you're not there. OK, right, useful. But here, wait, this is not the hook. The hook is the following. What's going to actually happen on the screen is there's going to be toasters. I know, right? It's huge, right? Flying toasters. Flying toasters. And there's going to be a preference in there where you can, um, there'll be toast on the screen, too. You can actually set the color of the toast, right? This is. This is a million dollar, dollar idea, this idea of flying toasters. What do you think, Ted? You want to invest in this? You are correct, Ted. <laughs> Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Ted says it's probably a good idea. They've probably done, they made millions of dollars. But I, million would, I would also ask, why do you need a, an investor for it? Isn't this a project? It's you could part do of the without? presentation, dude. Ah. Just roll with it. 
you're a patsy. <laughs> they made millions of dollars. Software that is useful when you're not there. Toasters with preferences for the darkness of the toast. People, this is nutty. Millions of dollars. It's like absurd. I mean, we take it for granted as Mac people of these flying toasters, and it's part of our culture. But think about it. Millions of dollars. It's absurd. It's brilliant. And when I was building this talk, I, um, I realized, I'm like, who are these people behind this company, which was called Berkeley Systems? It was a, two folks named Wes Boyd and John Blades, who after they left, uh, after they sold it to, they sold it, I forget who they sold it to, was it Sierra? And they created MoveOn.org. Now, if you don't know what MoveOn.org, this is incredibly, this is, well, maybe you don't care, but it's a politically left, they use the web to actually organize people um, um, around politics. These are crazy people. These are volatiles. I guarantee it. I don't know them at all. I bet you go to them and you'd be like, this is who you're kind of nuts. What's going on here, right? Volatiles create these amazing things that often have disproportionate value. Here's the problem. These two groups have allergic reactions to each other. Most of my job, former job, um, has to do with getting the stables and the volatiles to actually get along. These guys and gals hate each other. They hate each other. The volatiles believe the stables are slow, lazy, political bureaucrats. The stables believe the volatiles are hold nothing sacred. They do whatever the hell they want. Company, team, product, be damned. And here is the catch. Everyone's right. Now, they're in their archetypes here, but that's, they're, they're correctly identifying the archetypes. They're going to fight. This is what's going to happen in a, group, a larger group of people. Second, if you're planning on growing, if you're going to build a company, a team, a project that's going to thrive, you need both of these folks. The reward for shipping 1.0, successful 1.0, is actually a curse. And it's a cautionary tale that I want to tell you, which is, um, I've been at Borland, I worked at Borland. Borland, how many people? I'm with my people, this is good. I was at Netscape. Um, Netscape, yeah, right, okay, got it. And I'm sure you've heard of this. Um, <laughs> for each of these companies, the curse of each of these companies, the curse of 1.0 is the following. They go and they ship their 1.0, whether it's Borland, where it's a beautiful IDE, Turbo Pascal IDE, just like, I mean, do we, if you haven't, first time you actually saw an IDE after you were sitting at the command line, like, you know, bleeding tears out of your eyes, you're like, oh my God, this is transforming. Philippe Kahn was there, did that, volatile. Netscape, the browser, Apple, you know, uh, the Apple II. Each of these things, they created um, this thing, and the thing that happens is the volatiles are usually there, whether it's Philippe or Steve or Andreessen. They go and they get it done, and they, and they start to do something which is very dangerous. What happens is the volatiles become stables. What happens in this place, in this world, is they start to say, these are the crown jewels. These are the things that we built, and they're sacred. So what we're going to do here is we're not going to we're going to milk it for as long as we possibly can. But the thing that shows up, the thing that happens is the volatiles who are there they attract other volatiles so they can smell. They're like that is an innovative company, Netscape, Borland, wherever, Apple. They come in and the volatiles do what volatiles do is they start blowing shit up and pissing people off, and the volatiles who are already there who are protecting the crown jewels actually start to become stable. They say stop volatiles, stop doing that thing that you were meant to do, please, it's the crown jewels. We went to war for this. We have scars because we bled for these things. Please don't rock the boat. Let us go monetize whatever the hell it is that we're doing. This is a great way for companies to coast and to die. Hmm. What a yard sale of mediocrity. Anyone work here? Sorry, any Oracle people? IBM, HP, I apologize. What a yard sale of mediocrity. <laughs> now, you cannot argue for a moment that these companies are not wildly successful, making piles of money, huge amounts of money. But tell me something. Tell me the thing that one of these companies has done that inspired you. 
The only thing I can think of up here is maybe IBM Watson. That was kind of cool, the machine that Wasp got good at chess. But what's going on? There, there, people here, are, hundreds of thousands of people here, happily working, getting stuff done. But what have they done that's inspired you? Not throwing it away, protecting the crown jewels can be really good. But I think it's a good way to become stagnant and to become less of a product company and become more of a business model. When you go and you look at each of the companies that I had an opportunity to work at, <clears throat> these are companies that um, barely made it through. Actually, two of them didn't make it through. Borland, Philippe Kahn, you know what he did after they got rid of him? A little thing called a camera phone. He invented the camera phone. Philippe Kahn. Did you know that? How many camera phones are in the pockets right now? But they're still around. They're still stable. They're doing problem engineering, life cycle, process, tiers, whatever. I'm not sure what's going on there. Netscape, uh, their volatiles all left, and they got sold to AOL, which is a fate worse than death. And <laughs> Apple, I would say, of the th three companies up here, is the only one who made it through by the skin of their teeth to actually become volatile again and to get into the state of being innovative once more. My question to you is really simple. Do you or do you not want flying posters? I would argue that you probably do. Which gets us back to our plug. What the hell happened here? What were they doing? They went from that to that. It's small. They cleaned it up. It's kind of nice. You can put it in either way. It's beautiful. Thinner, so you can get thinner hardware. Works almost everywhere on the planet, except the UK, where they have to go and have an adapter, and we get in the plug nightmare once again. My question to you is, what is the actual issue? Why do we have kind of a beef when they announce this, and you're like, wait, oh boy, new plugs. Is this the issue? This is not the issue. In June, uh, sorry, September 7th, 2005, Steve got, Jobs got on stage, and he killed a wildly successful product. Remember this one? Beautiful piece of hardware. Last one with the hard drive, the small one with the hard drive. It was metal. It was gorgeous, had all these colors. You just kind of wanted to lick it. Weird. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing about it. It was a year and a half on the market. We couldn't, I was still there. We couldn't keep it in stock. We couldn't keep it in stock. It was the most successful consumer electronics at the time. And he showed what was, it looked like when the, this was announced, and he showed it what it looked like now, a year and a half later. What do you think happened? They started, all of the competition started to look pink and small and hard drive and started to catch up. So what he did was a very brave thing. Sorry, Mr. MBA. <laughs> he, what he did was he killed a huge line of business because he wanted to stay ahead of the competition. He chose innovation over profits. They could have done the iPod flat nano. The MacBook Pro 17 inch embedded battery we lost our shit. We were like, whoa, 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 whoa. Excuse me, I need to be able to replace the battery because I'm sure at some point I'm going to be stuck somewhere for 20 hours. I'm going to need two batteries to actually do it. We lost our minds when we, they, they, they embedded the battery and didn't make it changeable because we wanted that optionality. We're engineers. Keep all our options open. But they embedded it, and it was fine. It lasted long international flights, but more importantly, what they were working on at the time was they were figuring out, they were investing in, how are we going to build batteries? Why did they care about batteries back then? Oh, I don't know. It's probably in your pocket right now. They said, we need to get really good at this. We need to learn how to shove as much battery in as small a space as possible. And they threw away, I don't know how big, hundred of million dollar battery business. You, you bought maybe a battery from Apple at once. It kind of felt like highway robbery. Yeah. Um, Apple doesn't want to become stable desperately don't want to become stable. This is something that they care deeply about. I don't want to become stable either, which is why I quit my job. You need both of these folks. <laughs> You're all wondering where I'm going. Um, not back to Apple. Um, you need both of these folks in a team. You need both of these folks. Now, people tend to hire people that are like them. So a group of stables are going to hire more stables, and a group of volatiles aren't even going to show up for the interviews. Um, <laughs> They're gonna, that, that's one of the things you need. But you need to figure out in your team, whether it's 2, 20, or 200, how are you going to get these two groups to get along? The stables are there to remind you about the reality, 
can remind you about reality and to define process whereby, this is on YouTube right now, right? Sweet, awesome. Um, <laughs> define process whereby large groups of people can be coordinated to actually get work done. Your stables being predictability, credibility, repeatability to things you do, to your execution. And you need to have a world where these folks can thrive. You need to have the stables be nurtured. And you need these folks, too. You, your volatiles are there to remind you that nothing lasts forever. Sad. They consider it their mission into life to replace that which is inefficient, boring, and uninspired. You need to create a corner of a building where both of these folks can hang out where they can disrupt, where they can, everyone is clear about their respective value. Tim Cook is an engineer, I've read, but he's an operational genius. He's the guy who, A, got the gig after Steve Jobs, and he's the guy who's going to make sure that a couple hundred million of whatever is totally cool is sitting near your house when they announce it. Now, anyone who's done anything operationally knows how incredibly hard that is. And they gave him the company, the operations guy, the stable. This is a big deal. You need to figure out how to build a world they can both survive. You need to figure out how they can appreciate the other side of the fence. <clears throat> Where the stables or the volatiles can look over the, the cube doors into the stables office and go like, wow, wow, it's so tidy in here. You're like all this, everything's put in, everything's, everything's so deliberate, and you've got your, a thing for your pencil that's so tidy. How do, you, how do you think with all of this cleanliness? And the volatile and the stables are going over to the cue balls of the volatiles, and they look and go, what a fucking mess. <laughs> how, how do you, this is, this is chaos. Like, is that, like, you've got 17 coffee cups in here. Why do you need all these coffee? Is that a flying toaster? Because <laughs> that's fucking cool. <laughs> when Steve came back, he learned something very powerful. He learned that what he was good at and what he was bad at. And he hired the people, Tim Cook included, who were going to augment him where he didn't have a superpower. He knew where he was weak. You need to figure out, you need to be willing to throw away stuff that you cherish. This is hard. Because when you built that thing and you got 1.0 done, you bled for it. And you have scars for it. And throwing it away is really hard. Nature, my friends, abhors a vacuum. By throwing something away, by letting someone go, you create this incredible world of opportunity where all these people and things jump in to fill that space. You need to figure out how to distribute blank slates. At my former company, we did this thing called the Blitz. And uh, at Apple, when Steve came back and this has to do with the Blitz, he got rid of sabbaticals. Because what happened was, I think at four or five years, I forget, People would get a sabbatical, they would go on there three to six weeks, and they'd come back, and they'd quit. <laughs> Which is not the point of a sabbatical. You're supposed to recharge. So he got rid of sabbaticals, because he didn't want to do that. And I knew this lesson. And I decided, OK, at Palantir, I used to get a note around people got there about three years, and we put them on a blitz. And a blitz was, you have three months to go build whatever the hell you want. And by the way, within a certain group, you can choose the people that you're going to go work on with them on this thing. They can build whatever they want. They could build Angry Birds if they wanted to. They didn't. They, they legit built two new product lines for us over the course of the past couple of years with absolutely no direction. We didn't tell them what to do, and they just built it. The power, that's the power of the blank slate. You need to figure out how to have equal representation and investment in these stables and the volatiles. One group tends to win. One group tends to dominate. And I would argue on that slide, on the yard sale slide, a lot of stables are really doing great work in keeping those companies very stable. <clears throat> if you just have stables, a whole lot of work gets done, but it's uninspired and it's vanilla. If you just have volatiles, it's crazy town and nothing gets done. It's like fireworks and amazingness, but it never actually gets done. To a builder, which I would argue most of you are, I would assume, Stagnation is death. You want to know why I don't work where I used to work? It's because I was getting bored. Bored people quit. 
they do? Especially us, because a lot of opportunity. We get bored, we quit. You need to figure out in your team, your company, your product team, what are we doing to create a good sense of the of value of the stables and a good sense of the value of the, in the volatiles? Humans are bad <laughs> at making decisions. This is, these are stables that work, doing hard, hard work, making sure that each of these plugs is working great in their respective small domain. They are optimizing locally. I'm not arguing that there needs to be a volatile who's going to come in and revolutionize the power market, but someone, somewhere, could do something amazing here, and they could actually innovate here. And I would argue that it's probably a volatile. And he's, when he or she tells you what this amazing idea is, you're going to laugh at them. You're going to say, you are crazy. And they're going to keep doing it. And they're going to change the world by doing this. They're not going to do it by themselves. They're going to do it with a lot of help from the, sta from the, from the stables as well. Builders, wherever they are on the planet, all of you are in a unique position to change the world. Um, you need to figure out building how to build a world where they can both thrive. Because I think we all want a few more flying clusters. Thank you. I believe I can do some Q&A. And there's a microphone that's going to run around if you guys want to talk about this. Any questions for me? Sables, volatiles, toasters, Steve Jobs. Really? You really want to go out and drink. St. Regis, get the martini. It's delicious. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I was wondering. What's your name? Kyle. Your Sherm name? Kyle Sherman. Kyle? Nice yeah. Kyle. Um, great talk, by the way. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you yourself should strive to be in between or should try to go towards one or the other? Uh, me specifically, I'm a little volatile. That's how I tend. But my job, in, well, my old job in life was figuring out protocols between the two and figuring out how to bridge the gap between the folks. That was like a lot of what I've done. So um, it depends on what your job is. Like in an engineering team, uh, I'm gonna, probably going to be more volatile because I am deathly afraid of becoming irrelevant. So I will, I will deliberately cause disruption <laughs> so that we're constantly moving forward. And that's not an easy thing, and it pisses people off that count things and have spreadsheets and stuff like that. But I think that's a very important thing in, a, in a, an engineering team is to have that volatility there. It's, there's just some, when, the, when the stables take over, and these are good people, and they're well-intentioned, it just it's a buzzkill. <laughs> there needs to be that balance between the two. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Right behind you. Um, when you say you uh, build protocols to bridge the gap between yep. stables and volatiles, can yep. you give an example of what that really means? Yeah, so um, lots of them. Um, well, first off, there's, there's scalable protocols of like process that we've defined, and then there's just one off someone there who is basically translating between the two because they can't talk. So having those folks, having someone who can actually say, hey, uh, Michael Lee, I know you're volatile, and this is how you think, and I'm going to explain to you. Hi, Michael. I'm going to explain to you, Frank, over here, how he's thinking. And th th first off, having that person who can actually do that and can have a, uh, a hand on, on both sides of the a foot on both sides of the fence, that's super important, is that person who can actually go and do that. Um, there's other uh, specific things that we, we've done, I've done before, which is to basically create forums where the, uh, the volatiles is this thing we did at Apple and we did at Palantir called DNA, uh, Design and Architecture Review where it's getting together, it's a very lightweight meeting where we're going and reviewing what the volatiles are doing. And it, for, it, it's a very lightweight meeting. They hit stables, get to see what's going on, and there's a, a discussion about things, which the volatiles hate doing. But we structure in a way that we can see what's going on, we can understand there's a certain amount of process they have, go to, have to go through. It's not a ton, but it's a meeting which, is, uh, which creates exposure around the work they're doing, which they don't like to do. But that's meetings around that, people that are responsible for the communication, there's other things too. I could go on a while. Next to you. You mentioned um, What's people recruit. What's your name? Oh, Ram. You mentioned that um, people recruit them, I mean like themselves, right? Yeah. So in the, in the long term, doesn't that mean like when you do you know, group recruiting, group yep. interviews, how do you maintain the balance between the two? Well, first off, you gotta know, you gotta identify like what am I looking for? It's like, are you looking for more stable folks? Or are you looking for more uh, uh, volatiles? Um, 
there are people uh, in, if you don't have that person, if you're interviewing people and you don't have that team or that person who are jerks and like super good at either vetting stability or volatility, that's a huge problem. People in interviews tend to be nice. And um, that's actually really bad because they do, they hire, oh God, I really like you and you like the Montreal Canadiens, so do I, go Habs. So sad, um, whatever. But the point is, you, you, gotta have, you gotta have someone who's really good at interviewing that facet, the stability, the stability facet or the volatility. And they are really, they're ruthless at being able to do this. This is not a huge amount of people in a large organization. It's a very small set of people that are really good at vetting whether it's the technical skills, the aptitude, the culture, that sort of thing. Identifying those folks, letting them do that, and also trusting their decision making about it is huge. We have at Palantir, my former company, I would argue one of the hardest interviews right now, uh, recognized as one of the hardest interviews right now, and that's because we're ruthless about it. And we're really clear, they're really clear about who's good at it and who's bad at it. We do a lot of metrics. How did it work out? Where this person landed? Did they land stable? Did they land volatile? So it's, about, it's a recruiting process, making sure that's tuned right to find, identify and find and identify what you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, right back, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Louis. Um, I had a question about the, the blitz thing. So do you think the model of like every three years having a blitz and then maybe like rotate, rotating to another product team is like a good way to like keep people interested? Yep. Um, really whether do. they're like stable or volatile? Yeah, uh, more the volatiles than the stables because the stables like it and everything's kind of just working out. The volatiles need to see that the world can explode at any point. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's more for the volatile mindset, but it's that I think everyone benefits from it because you just kind of get into this rut of like, hey, I know how it all fits together and it's all working. And like having the world, you know, control, alt, delete is terrifying, exciting, and a great way to learn. So I think it benefits more the volatiles and the stables, but I think it's, I, I, the folks who go in, who went into those at Palantir, it was I, the whole spread of folks. There's usually a volatile in there who's really fucking shit up too. Anyway, other questions, yeah. How am I doing on time? Am I good? Okay, great. Hi, Phil. Hi. Um, so you mentioned how a volatile can turn into a stable by protecting the crown yep, jewel, yep, for instance. Yep. I can totally understand that. Yep. Have you seen the other way around, where a stable becomes volatile? Yeah, usually when they go to a new company. <laughs> and they've kind of given up on this dogma about protecting the crown jewel. It's like, I'm actually doing this right now. It's totally cool. Um, it's when you stop like being protective of this thing that you, like legit, like are honoring and protecting this thing that you built. But you kind of, this is the reason the blitz is so good. It's like giving that, those people, that team, that blank slate, it lets them revert back to like maybe their default state. Which is of a volatile, probably. It, maybe, it could be. It, again, remember these are archetypes. Don't get hung up on like A or B, right? right? It's no, like course. people are situationally volatile and stable and that sort of thing. But like, yeah, I think that's, that reset kind of gets people back to whatever their core principles are. Yeah. Hi, Gautam here. So you described a very uh, common thing that happens in my house as well. I tell my wife every three years, I'm bored and oh, face falls. Gosh, so any advice that. in dealing with that? Um, I just did this like, like oh, about a month ago. Um, <laughs> the thing about people, by the way, people, is we fear change. And um, you just got to give humans time to process. So I know that my wife's reaction and all the people around me reaction to that is going to be, what? Oh my God! Da da da! Let them do that. That's great, you know. But give them a couple of weeks and keep talking about it. This is change management with humans is the same thing. It's like, like throwing something solid and unblocking people is a really bad idea. It's like you got to give them time to kind of process. So each time she does, she goes, she knows what's happening and she knows it's going to be, you know, volatility is incoming. But it's test time, you know. So, and we'll, you know, it's like great leadership is letting people, giving people access to how you think. And like walking you through the process and being like, hey, I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm going to do here, blah, blah, blah. And like letting them in, right? Very often we have a lot of problem with leadership because they're just throwing dictates down. This is maddening. It's just empowering, right? So involve them in the conversation. So, yeah. And choose the right wife or husband, too. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Simon. Hi, Simon. Um, so there's this uh, personality test called, called um, uh, Myers-Briggs. Have you heard of it? I have. So, okay, so the, the main thing is like there are introverts and extroverts. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any tendency, tendencies of being stables more like introverts or 
Uh, let's see, so what is the one? INTP, are you in the room right now? INTP, oh yeah. Probably more than you think because you haven't had to get the test. Um, it, it's, I'm sure that there's, I'm sure there's a witty answer to this. I'm sure that some of the, the grid of uh, Myers-Briggs, it's basically a personality you answer 70, 80 questions or something like that, and they say, hey, you're emotional, you're introspective, or blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, it's a useful thing, and I, we used to teach it at Palantir as sort of a way to understand, to give nerds a framework for thinking about humans. Um, the thing about it is go take a test three times on three different days and watch what happens. <laughs> You're like that one day because you're mad because the barista did the thing to your coffee, blah, blah, blah. You actually are in a different personality. And you're like, wow, I'm suddenly not empathetic at all. That's weird. I actually, <laughs> I actually did it twice already. Yeah, I, I do it every once in a while. I mean, you're going to see a trend, but it's like it really varies. It's an interesting thing because it's a great uh, way to label things and have a discussion about them. But uh, stables and volatiles, is just, it's, just, it's a spectrum on there, and it's a reason to start thinking about how people work. Forget about the label and understand that there's people out there who are volatile. They're jerks. They like to just blow shit up. And, right, and sometimes they're stable. And sometimes, that's, that's the point is to kind of get an understanding of like, what is the spectrum and how does this person, this team fit in that spectrum? Cool. And yes. Oh, oh, lots of questions. Multiple microphones. Moving around. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rowan. Um, so I have a number of people who I work with who are very stable, but. I think they'd benefit from being more volatile. I'd rather they not leave the company. Are they engineers? Um, sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> they're, sometimes they're also uh, product managers. Okay, got it. How, what should I do, or what have you seen work or not work for How big is your company? Um, the group I work with is like 150. Um, and why do you think that they need some volatility injection? Um, because they see they're very comfortable, but they're also very bored and disinterested. Uh, my advice with very little data, all questions that involve people usually are answered with, it depends. Um, my advice is you need, to, you need to put them in a totally different environment. And by the way, this is, we as leads are not incentivized to do what I just suggested because we're protecting the things that we're working on and we have deliverables and these stables are yelling at us for Gantt charts and all that shit. But it's, um, but you, as a, and this is something we were working on at Palantir is you have to willing them, like urge them to go into this other place. And by the way, if they're really getting stable, they're probably not going to want to do this. And you're gonna, like, so call it, call it an experiment. Hey, you're going to do three months over here with Michael Lee, and that'll fucking rock your world, right? <laughs> It'll be amazing. You will learn so much. You will be uncomfortable. And you can see, they can see what it's like. But you got to get over your leadership intuition of like, hey, let's keep everything organized and Gantt charting and, all, and let them go do that. It's, it's an investment in the people. We don't do this because we're usually charging forward to our release or whatever the very responsible thing we are doing. But you will keep them longer by getting them that reset. Board people quit, by the way. Yeah. There's someone else over here. Right here? Yep. Here. Um, what is next for you? Do you know yet? I do. And Can't tell you till Monday. Tuesday. <laughs> well, then never mind my second. <laughs> I will tell you something that you didn't ask. I will answer the question that you did not ask. Why? And the uh, reason is, uh, it's an, I'm an engineer, and I wasn't being an engineer, and it's very important for me to be an engineer. I like building shit. All right, what else? Other questions? Here. In the back. In yeah, the my question is twofold. Uh, Nick, first. Hi, Nick. Uh, hi. Uh, one is, how do you reward uh, the, the honest tables? or creative people uh, do you, because I've seen sometimes they have difficulty managing uh, stable people. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, in the uh, organization, you want to somehow give them more visibility uh, in the food chains. And some, some of them care about that deeply. Wait, are we, sorry, I, I missed the very beginning of it. Are we saying how do we reward and recognize the stables? Is that yeah, what you're saying? Uh, unstables or volatile. The volatiles don't care about that shit at all. They don't need the recognition, and they just tend to blow things up and get fired, and they're like, screw it, I'll go somewhere else. Um, it, it, you need to figure out to how to not let them like, blow things up and really piss people off. On the stable side, and this is really important. I'm kind of I'm answering a different question than you asked. Uh, but like these stables, we tend to make fun of them. I've done it a couple times in this talk. You know, The people that are the bean counters and the people who do Gantt charts, and all the, these are incredibly important people. The only reason I had a modicum of success at Apple was they have this uh, role at Pal uh, Palantir. 
not Palantir anymore, Apple called an EPM, Engineering Project Manager, Program Manager? I forget, it's been a while. Um, but they are stables. And what do they do? They're project managers. For the record, 60% of project managers are awful, but that other 40% are amazing. Their ability to deconflict, to keep track of everything, to keep sure the trains run on time. So my answer to your question that you didn't ask is like, we need to recognize these people as being incredibly valuable. They need to be awesome at what they do, but recognizing it. It's not sexy work. It's intangible, hard to, it's very, it's, it's intangible, not sexy, you're not developing the new who's he what's, but it's essential in a team of people to actually get shit done. So recognizing it. And do you see any of, of this experience trickling down to business schools? Because I see at the, one of the problem I see with today corporate America is part of it that is run by, by professional managers is doing professional really- Professional managers, what does that well, mean? Oh, well, gross. It's really doing bad. Look at the, for example, three uh, major auto manufacturers. Oracle, IBM, HP, maybe. Well, well the <laughs> auto sector versus Silicon Valley. I yeah. mean, how, how do you see- I think Elon home? Musk is a great example of what happens when you put an engineer in charge. And the guy is a total dictator, that's a different talk, and he's, uh, he's a, probably a great, but it's like, that's these, my, we have a, we, ha, we, we, Palantir, that I used to work at, um, had a really uh, issue with the MBA types. Now these are talented, smart people, right? And, um, but what is the value that they're creating, right? What is, what is the thing that they produce? They do an anal a lot of analysis, and this is important stuff, but it's uh, what I see in a lot of product companies is when the MBAs take over, <coughs> Microsoft, um, <sighs> you, you see this innovation quotient, whatever the hell it is, go down because they're counting and they're making safe bets. And they're saying, by the way, X percent of our business is based on Microsoft Office, so we will protect the crown jewels. When maybe a volatile be like, let's fucking blow it up and start over again. This is not a great idea, by the way, because Office is whatever that is. Um, but it's like, that's, that's the sort of thing that I think you get when you bring that MBA mindset to the table. It's very safe. It's very profitable, probably, but it's not going to be a company which is building things that inspire us, in my opinion. How are we doing? Any other questions? One more question. Nope. All right. Have a great week, guys and girls.